All right, now we're doing Punarvasu Nakshatra. So it comes after Ardra. And as you recall, Ardra is the storm star, you know, the cleansing, stormy star that destroys the violators and the impurities, metabolism, you know, Shiva. He's the changer of the form. Punarvasu comes after it. And it is the return of the light or the return of the good thing, the cleansed thing. So Punarvasu is ruled by the mother goddess Aditi. And Punarvasu literally, you know, Punar means um, kind of like how we use the English word re. It's like redoing something, renewing, rejuvenating. So whenever you hear that word re in front of something, you can actually kind of just right away think about or associate it with Punarvasu. Punar, it means, um, it's like to do again, you know, it means once again, right? And so there, it means, uh, and so Vasu, so if you take once again, restoring, you know, Punar, and then you take Vasu, Vasu means, uh, it's very interesting, Vasu means basically like anything that exists and is shiny and uh, radiant and desirable. So it can mean, um, <clears throat> Like it says here in our in the manual, um, Vasu means many things, but refers to light and shining and radiance. Vasu means excellent, good, beneficent, sweet, dry, anything that shines or any desirable precious object. So Vasu refers to any riches, wealth, goods, gold, jewels, gems, or property. Now Vasu is also a name for the gods that rule Danishta Nakshatra. So when we get to Danishta, also called Shravishta, when we get to that, we're going to be learning a lot more about the Vasus, and that's the one of the main nakshatras of like being wealthy and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so this nakshatra has a lot to do with wealth, but then just also keep in mind the Vasus really have more to do with Danishta, and a lot of times people overly give Vasu interpretations to this nakshatra when they already rule one, so it doesn't make any sense, right? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, Vasu, this comes from the Vedic root Vas, which means like to shine or to grow bright. And it refers to the dawn as well, which is like a returning of the light, you know? Um, and the dawn was heavily worshipped in Vedic culture, and I want to get into that more, um, but it goes into the the roots of Vedic civilization and stuff as well but the dawn you know it's all about the the worship of the fire in vedic religion the light you know and there's three forms of fire one of which is the sun um so the dawn the return of the sun this is a very big deal um but yeah so vasu can thus mean anything that exists that is desirable anything that exists and is perceivable and it shines and it grows bright like the sun so it can refer to a person too, not just an object, but really anything. So this is the nakshatra of the return of the bright, desirable thing, the return of the good. So you might hear it, that's why you might actually hear it translated or like the sutras uh, from the Taittiriya Brahmanas translated, the restoration of good, punarvasu, that's the term, that's how they translate it in English. The, punar, the restoration of good for aditi is wind from above and moisture from below. So that's one of the main sutras, and that's a very important um, way to understand it, is by contemplating that. And we will get to that more in time. So yeah, it can also mean um, the return of the light, the return of um, not just the good, but the goods, as in the valuables, the wealth. Um, like, so I have a fun Prajna example of when I lost my wallet and found it, and the ruling planet was in Punarvasu, indicating I would return my wealth, you know? Um, <clears throat> so we can use this understanding in a very practical way, and it's about returning anything precious, anything desirable, uh, the, the return of the good days, you know, the return of summertime, you know, you can think of this in so many ways. Um, the return of valuables is one of the most common ones. So at Ardra, you know, everything got destroyed, and now the energy is cleansed and ripe for the return of this excellent, precious thing, which is nature. And that's why, you know, the goddess always represents nature, and this is a goddess star. It's ruled by Aditi, the divine mother, the mother goddess. Um, and, yeah, as you see in the sutra, um, it's wind from above, 
and moisture from below. And so again, like wind blows new things to us, you know, wind blows fresh new things. And so it's literally, this is the nakshatra of fresh air. Um, this is the nakshatra of, again, fresh air is what we need to rejuvenate. You know, the return of the life, the life, the prana is in the wind. So this is a nakshatra of wind. And it's also a, as we're going to find, a moving and unsteady nakshatra. So it's moving, changing, chara, you know, it, it's, it's moving around. Just like wind, it's trying to change things up and bring freshness to things. And that's the other word given is ardrum, which means uh, freshness, moisture, aliveness, greenness. Um, like the vibrancy of a fresh new green plant, you know, is ardrum. And notice that they're using the same word, ardrum. <clears throat> Ardra was the star that came before it. So there's no coincidence that they're using the word ardrum, showing that this is part of a connected process of going from ardra, um, going from Rudra's energy to, to Punavasu to get the ardrum, the freshness. I also noticed that there's a number of points where the sutras refer back to a previous word from a previous nakshatra. And I think that that's also kind of a hint about nature and about the moon and about the way that life works in general, because the way that nature works, they've studied it and they found that, okay, for a tree when it's growing, if it grew six leaves, its next branch, it will look back and it will grow a certain number of leaves based on what it had just grown. So if it was like three, six, then it might grow nine or whatever. But trees follow patterns of growth. You know, nature follows certain patterns. And the basic pattern is that you look back to where you were at to see where to go next. And that's kind of what these sutras are hinting at. They're basically saying, like, they're, you know, we this nakshatra is coming off of these previous ones, so look back at these and see what these did, and then that's what's going to lead into this. So I think that's why it used the word ardram, was to kind of hint at this connection. But we see a few more of those as we go through all these sutras. And, yeah, it's like, it just reminds me of the way that nature and growth works or like you think about the uh, is it the golden mean spiral yeah the golden ratio how it uh <clears throat> that i actually relate that a lot to this nakshatra so it's funny that i'm bringing it up but yeah like the golden ratio how things grow exponentially but based on the last you know square the last quarter i feel like i'm not explaining that very well um because i'm not an expert on all those things but <clears throat> that's kind of how punarvasu works so that actually brings me to an interesting point Punarvasu is this big nakshatra of like repeating patterns and repeating things over and over. Um, and it can have to do a lot with like sacred geometry, fractals, um, yeah, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, you know, these sort of ways of like mapping how nature expands and grows. And because this really is the nakshatra of nature expanding and growing. <clears throat> and so uh, that's what Aditi represents as well. Um, is the aspect of just expanding nature. Um, yeah, so there's really a lot, uh, a lot of cool things about this, this nakshatra to cover. Okay, now the symbol for Punarvasu is either a bow or a house. And I like the house symbolism a lot more, and I'll tell you why. Well, first off, I have to say that I don't really like the symbols the nakshatras are given a lot of times because in Vedic culture, things are just like on or off. There's just right or wrong. There's just kind of this more, things are a lot more black and white, at least as they're taught in Vedic culture. And so I just don't understand why there's more than one symbol ever given for any nakshatra. That's just not logical, you guys. And so we have to understand that nakshatras are really, really, really old. And there's no way they haven't been embellished or altered or a little bit, you know, changed. <clears throat> Especially because so much of the original knowledge of them is lost. <clears throat> so when you keep that in mind, it really just seems like uh, it's most likely that all the nakshatras originally had one symbol. But we'll find that some of them even have three symbols that are given for them. And that's just got to be an embellishment, you know? Um, uh, what I mean by that is like a thing added in by someone who wasn't enlightened and who was doing their best to teach and was probably very wise and had a good reason for it, but it maybe wasn't as good as the original pure symbolism that they just maybe didn't understand as well. 
And again, I might be misunderstanding all this too, right? So you always, you know, each teacher is going to emphasize or alter things a little bit. But in general, Vedic culture is really into just like repeating it exactly the way it is. Like the the Vedas, the mantras, everything is chanted the exact same way. Sanskrit is not something that can have an accent. There's no such thing as an accent in Sanskrit. It's only pronounced one way. And that's because it's like a computer code. It's like a mystical code that cannot be altered. And so in a lot of ways, like we have to be really happy and and <clears throat> really thank those Brahmins and those people who repeated these things and memorized them and didn't alter them. But every now and then something has to slip in and, and be missed. So, yeah, I noticed that with just these nakshatra symbols, you know. Um, <clears throat> The 12 sign zodiac, there's no, there's, you know, there's no distinguishing and there's no mistaking those symbols. There's just one symbol given and they're not altered and things like that, you know. And with the nakshatras, I think that that's originally how it was. So I like the house symbol more. House makes a lot of sense for Punarvasu. The bow also does. But we just, it, you'll find that, well, we, the next star, Pusha, is also the star of an arrow. And it's like, what? So that's an arrow, there's a bow, and then we also have a bow, like, the bow sign, Sagittarius. So it's just confusing and kind of just, <clears throat> kind of just repetitive, right? Um, but yeah, Punarvasu symbolized, you'll see it symbolized by a bow. Well, because what it, like, you know, you shoot a bow and arrow, and you shoot the arrow, and you return it, right? So it symbolizes expanding and moving and covering a lot of space. And, you know, flying in the wind, like, because it is a star of wind and freshness. And then returning that back to you. So we can see how it does relate to a bow and arrow, yes. But if you understand it as a house, you'll get a lot further. Um, <clears throat> and we don't have any symbols, symbolism of a house, really. Um, so yeah, I do feel that the bow symbol is um, a little bit overused, and pushya or tisha makes more sense for the arrow, and then bow and arrow, that's kind of confusing because they're just both like associated together. Um, but yeah, the symbol of the house seems to be a more accurate symbol because if you actually just look at Punarvasu, it's Castor and Pollux is the stars. It's just a big square. It just is one of the most noticeable squares, like a house. It's just one of the most noticeable houses that there could be in the heavens. So it actually looks like a house. So that kind of fits. Um, and yeah, they make up this square that just looks like a house in the heavens that is an abode of the mother goddess, Aditi, you know? And um, the other thing is that, you know, we are going to find that, you know, Aditi, the mother goddess, like this is a big star of rejuvenation um, it's got a very nurturing, restorative type of energy. It does not have a strong warlike energy that a bow symbolizes at all. This is not a war star. You know what I mean? There are stars that have to do with war, like the one we just went through, Ardra, big one. You know, but this one is not about destruction, <clears throat> and a bow is a destructive weapon. A house is a place that you go to rejuvenate to refresh, to nourish yourself, to feel the goddess, the nurturing aspect of nature. A house is where you go for that. So a house is definitely a better symbol. A house is also something that you leave and return to, and you return once again, returning to the good, returning to the light, returning to the desirable thing, ideally your wife. Punarvasu is actually called Jaya, or the word for a wife. Um, so this is the wife nakshatra also, but not, not as much as the Palguni nakshatras, which they also use that word for. So, you know, you see a lot of connections to the home, you know, and returning back to that good and desirable thing, which is what our home ideally is. You know, we go to work, we get beat up by life, we work hard, exhausting ourselves, and then we leave our home and we seek, or sorry, we leave our work and we seek the rejuvenation of the home, which is the mother goddess and Aditi. So, um... The home is the place where we nourish ourselves and where we get rejuvenated and we return again to our home. So it's really quite fitting, I think, as a house and a home for the symbol of this nakshatra. Um, or perhaps it changed it sometimes, but I think this is the more fitting one now. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny, too, because uh, it falls in the sign of cancer, which is the Rashi of the home. So you have a nice overlap here. 
but um, <clears throat> in other ages it did not fall in that nakshatra or in that sign. But in this age it falls in that sign. So plants in Cancer and in Punarvasu are going to have a lot of emphasis on home or the house or rejuvenation and going into that place. Um, and just, yeah, so now you guys know one really important thing about Punarvasu. It is the star of finding a home, of returning to your homeland, or of... Uh, going back home after a long journey or any of these sorts of things. Um, and here's what's really interesting is that I know that depending on this is sort of a controversial topic to talk about the uh, history and the origins of Vedic culture, but there's different ideas, you know, there's the idea of the indigenous Aryan theory that, you know, the Aryans were indigenous to India, and then there's the idea of the Aryan invasion theory that they came from elsewhere. I think that there's a little, I think there's a lot of truth to both. At first, I thought the Aryan invasion theory was just like super racist, like, oh, we have to believe that white men came in and conquered y'all, and that's why the Ve that's why the Vedas are good and stuff. It actually, turns out that's not the case. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, and you know, like for example, the fact that uh, there are no horses in the fossil record in ancient India. We know as astrologers that Ashwini, the horse, like sun rides on a seven horse chariot, like the horses are so important. Every year the king would do a horse sacrifice um, for the good of the kingdom. The Ashwamedha Yagya was one of the biggest rituals and ceremonial sacrifices in ancient India. And if there's no horses in the fossil record in India, then that is a little weird. And so it is more likely that Vedic culture was a global culture, a much more spread out culture. And that's probably why all the European languages have their origins in Sanskrit, the Proto-Indo-European um, culture of people. And all these people worshipped 12 signs. They worshipped the sun and they had 12 signs zodiacs, you know, the Nordics, the Greeks. It's, it's very likely that there was a like an Atlantis or a higher age global culture at one point and then a cataclysm or a, a shift happened and then they had to leave their original homeland and spread out. And so the reason that I'm bringing this up is because evidentially, according to a really great scholar named Bal Gangadhar Tilak, he wrote a book about this. He says that based on his calculations, when the Aryans would have left and done their migrations um, would have been when the Punarvasu was on the equinox. So you see, if you once you start to realize that the nakshatras are not tied to the sidereal zodiac, they have no connection whatsoever, they're behind the zodiac, and they change over ages. So over the ages, different nakshatras are on the vernal equinox when spring happens, which is what spring is, just so you know. So when the sun begin spring on March 21st, the star that it's in right now is Uttara Bhadrapada. But back when these texts were written, or back, you know, when Brihat Parashra was written, Ashwini was on the equinox. And then before that, um, well, if you go back to Taittiriya Brahmana, the text we're working with, it lists Kritika as the first nakshatra, because Kritika was on the equinox when it was created, when this text was written. So the first nakshatra is just whatever nakshatra is on the equinox in that age. So if an enlightened sage wrote a book right now, he'd list Uttara Bhadrapada as the first, believe it or not. Now, what I'm getting at here is that, yeah, so it looks like when the Aryan invasion, ha or sorry, when the Aryans had to migrate and leave their homeland, Punarvasu was on the vernal equinox, this nakshatra of the homeland, of the house. So the process, the ages, the thousand years that, that they were trying to find their new homeland and found India and, you know, settled into all that long ago, long ago, long ago, this, you know, this was happening when Punarvasu was on the equinox. And I forget the exact year, but we're talking way back. Um, <clears throat> and so this actually explains a lot of the symbolism given to Punarvasu because it's a char, it's a moving and unsteady star. So it's about moving and changing and traveling and finding a new home. And it's the nakshatra of a home. And it's the star of returning again, returning to that glorious state. You see, the, they were in a very high state, and then they had to leave that, and they had to return to that. So that's the punarvasu. You know, that's what was going on when this nakshatra happened. So that's more in the sense of mundane astrology. And at the end of this course, if I get time, I'd love to teach more about that, because you can actually learn about, like, the ages of history and what was going on um, 
based on studying what nakshatra was on the vernal equinox. So it's very interesting, and that kind of reveals more to, about Punarvasu. So Punarvasu is all about like migrating groups, like people migrating, trying to find a new home, trying to you know start again, you know, um, trying to carry the torch to a new land and start anew. Uh, pilgrimages, um, you know, if you have some, you might find people that you know who've had to be immigrants or migrate or leave, you know, one country and go to another and try to start again. They might have had a lot of Punarvasu going on. Dwelling in foreign lands is a big thing with this. All right. Thanks.